Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Dustin Campbell, Tim Deputy, and Brandon Brooks. Coming up on DTNS, are you tired of government targeting big tech? Well, the U.S. Senate bets you're not, and they're going after Google's ad business. Plus, do we need more platforms to add gaming? This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, May 19th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From Austin Tech, we have Justin Robert Young. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. We are going to put your face on a refrigerator later in this episode, but let's start with a few tech things you should know. Hey, good news for framework fans. The the makers of the modular laptop announced uh, 12th gen Intel chips are available in their brand new second generation framework laptop models, as well as in replacement mainboards for existing models. The whole point of modular, right? Like if you want to upgrade to the 12th gen chip, you don't have to get a whole new laptop. You can just swap out the mainboard now. Uh, the full laptops, if you're starting from scratch, run between $1,049 and $2,049. Those will start shipping in July. The mainboards will cost you between $449 and $1,049. Again, there's three chips in each of these. Uh, there's also a replacement top cover that will add a little more rigidity to the body. Again, something then we don't have to replace the whole laptop. If you've been like, that's eh, kind of floppy, you can just replace that that top. Uh, later this year, Framework will put out an expansion card with a Realtek RTL 8156 controller that will support 2.5 gigabit Ethernet. The U.S. Justice Department announced a new policy Thursday saying, quote, good faith security research should not be charged, end quote, under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, CFAA, This is a big shift away from the department's previous policy that allowed prosecutors to bring federal charges against hackers who find security flaws as a way to help secure uh, exposed or vulnerable systems. The CFAA was enacted in law in 1986, but has been criticized for outdated and or vague language that does not help good faith researchers or hackers. Yeah, I mean, it's a nice step for the policy change, but it has not changed the actual law, so they could change their policy at any time. Uh, Good news for the phone market. Canalys estimates smartphone shipments in North America rose 4% on the year last quarter. Apple increased its already dominant market share past the 50% mark, 51% led by sales of the iPhone 13. Samsung grew one point in North America to 28% of the market. Lenovo, mostly because of Motorola, rose 56% to take third with 7% of the market. TCL dropped 21%, but still held on to fourth for 5% of the market. And Google cracked the top five of the smartphone market with 380% growth over last year. That gives them 1% of, of the market, but hey, it's a start. Number one. They're number one. (laughs) Percent. Percent. Hey, who's ready for some Apple rumors? Uh, Mark Gurman of Bloomberg says that uh, Apple showed off an almost finished mixed reality headset to members of its board of directors last week. Sources indicate that the next step is to finish development of the operating system for it, referred to as Reality OS or ROS for short. Something called ROS was referred to once in an early build of iOS 13 and has shown up in other logs as well. German sources think that the headset might launch later this year or next year. Do you think anyone at Apple thought it was hubris to name a reality or name an operating system reality? Uh, no, I, I, I think uh, uh, that is the uh, branding, baby. <laughs> uh, yesterday's show, we had an explainer about Tether, the stable coin, and how one of the issues with it was exactly how it's backed. Well, Bloomberg reports Tether has revealed some more details about the cash and securities that are backing the Tether stablecoin. As of March 31st, its bank, MHA Cayman, assured that Tether had assets totaling $82.4 billion. And at the time, its liabilities, which are mostly Tether coins that you could cash in for a single dollar, totaled $82.2 billion. So it had more cash than it had liabilities. Tether further reported that it had reduced its holding of commercial paper to $20.1 billion and increased its investments in U.S. Treasury bills and money market funds to $39.2 billion. In other words, its non-cash reserves 
were moved to less risky, more easily convertible assets. And that's good if you're worried uh, about the ability to, to get your dollars out of them. But it also would reduce the impact on the non-crypto markets if Tether did have to suddenly sell down all its commercial paper holdings. They, they wouldn't be flooding the market as much because they don't hold as much of it. All right. Let's talk about reading. Fast reading, speed reading. I got an API for you, Justin. Oh, well, why don't you tell me about it, Tom? Tech in Asia highlights a technology called bionic reading that uses an old speed reading trick to look at just the first part of words and changes online text to make it faster to read. It increases the size and bolds the first part of words just enough to help your brain recognize the word without having to look at all the letters. You know, let's give you an example. The phrase reading and understanding would have R E A D A and U N D E R S T all highlighted. That's enough for your brain to know what those words are and move on to the next word even faster. The kind of trick can even improve focus and is possibly helpful for those with reading problems like dyslexia. Yeah. Joe, our video producer uh, said it, it, it's very helpful. Uh, for that, like he, his direct experience. Uh, Bionic Reading has an API which has already been implemented in reading platforms, Reader 5, Fiery Feeds, and Liar. Now, don't worry if you've never heard of those. The, those are reading platforms that you could try, but they're, they're hoping to get more folks to take this API. They do charge for the API, but it's the kind of thing that, that could help you be able to scan through documents faster. Uh, and I was fascinated with the idea, and I, I'm I'm not even certain that Bionic is the first one to try this, but it's the first time I've seen anybody take one of those old speed reading tactics, which I'll be honest, I am too impatient to actually master. I know lots of people who have, but I've always like sat down and been like, ah, that seems like a lot of work. I'm not going to spend the time. This means I don't have to master it. I don't have to learn to look at the first parts of words. It's just going to pop them out. And if you go to bionic-reading.com, you can look at some of the samples and try it and it really is faster to read the ones where they've emphasized those first parts of words. It, it works. Uh, our mutual friend, Andrew Maine has recently gotten obsessed with speed reading and has gone through a bunch of different uh, uh, strategies to help him do it. This is certainly one of them. Uh, uh, they're also uh, on some Kindles. There is a format where it will just flash one word at a time, but in a faster uh, manner. So you are focusing only on that but you are comprehending everything really uh, the most controversial elements of these uh, uh tactics are sure they'll help you read faster mm -hmm. but will they help you comprehend and, yeah. and, and that is uh, uh up to a lot of debate and really i think probably a person by person situation uh the the argument bionic makes on that is you'll be less distracted because you're 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 not drifting as much, so that you're focused and moving faster. And then they they sort of just wave their hands and imply that that equals comprehension, yeah, which yeah, it yeah, may yeah. or may not, right? I mean, and look, I, I do think that there is a bit of an existential crisis when it comes to the internet and reading. Uh, we have a lot of things to distract us, and in an ever weakening ad market, the advertising solutions are only going to get more in your face. Meanwhile, we have an explosion of content, including fantastic new substacks like Tom's, where we <laughs> only have X amount of time in the day to read. And uh, a, a lot of folks aren't great about using tricks to format stuff so your eye is more easily uh, uh, mm -hmm. going by it. If you have gigantic blocks of text, then people are more likely to tap out at a certain point. So that is all to say that while we have more than ever to read, and yet we are less likely to read it, having solutions like this, I think, could be pretty, pretty uh, important. Yeah, Jahandar in our in our chat room makes a salient point. This tech seems pretty easy to reproduce without their API. Uh, the the point isn't that they've cracked the code on being able to do this. It's more of a if you don't want to put in the work to to reproduce it, you can pay them and it, and it, it makes it happen. It's plug and play. Yeah. So you know, like a lot of things, you can do it yourself. It might not be worth your time to do it yourself. So. I don't know how easy their API is to implement. Right. That's that's the the key question. There is does this allow you to do this to your app in a way that you wouldn't have considered before you know is it is it cheap enough and and does it save you enough time and are you fast enough <laughs> and does it improve things enough for your customers that they're like yes i want that hey tom reuters sources say that tiktok is testing mobile games with users 
in Vietnam with plans to expand elsewhere in Asia and other markets. But, you know, TikTok's done gaming before, right? Yeah, yeah. Protocol uh, noted that uh, gaming isn't new for the company. Du Yan, the uh, version of TikTok in mainland China, uh, has had many games since 2019. And TikTok itself partnered with Zynga, launched an HTML5 game called Disco Loco 3D in the U.S., on the platform last November. Uh, TikTok also released a mini game called Garden of Good with a nonprofit called Feeding America last June. So yeah, they've done this before. It looks like they just want to expand it. Yeah, Reuters expects the first releases to arrive this autumn and they will be ad supported. We don't know if they will continue to license games from folks like Zynga or build their own or both, but TikTok's parent company, ByteDance, bought a mobile game studio called Monotone last year. So Tom, mm. um, Explain to these fine folks why this move into gaming in Vietnam is happening. A hundred billion dollars, Justin. That's oh, why. That's uh, nice. Mobile game is expected to be worth more than a hundred billion dollars this year. Uh, and you want young people. So they picked Vietnam because 35, uh, or I'm sorry, 70% of the citizens in Vietnam are younger than 35. Uh, so Vietnam's a good place to start. A hundred billion dollars is a good reason. And Reuters notes that Ad revenue is important for TikTok right now, and ad revenue is booming for them. Insider Intelligence expects it to pass $11 billion this year without games. Uh, $11 billion, if TikTok hits that mark, would be more than the combined sales of Twitter and Snap. So, you know, the answer is money. Yes, and the fact that they've cracked ads, which means they know how to get people to buy ads, which means they need places to serve ads. Netflix and now TikTok are trying to cash in on games, which makes sense, although for different reasons. Does it make sense for users? Do consumers want to play games on non-gaming platforms? And really, when you look at both Netflix and TikTok, there are two different solutions to this. Netflix wants stickiness so you don't forget, uh, you don't uh, you don't remember that you have a subscription with them and you just continue to paying it every month forever. And TikTok wants more places that they can put their highly targeted ads. Yeah, TikTok wants your eyeballs. Netflix wants your memory. Uh, yeah. And I, I try to resist the bias of, well, I don't do this. So yeah. it must not be necessary because I don't really play a lot of mobile games anyway. So I'm, I'm a horrible test case for this. Uh, I know that a lot of people play mobile games, but I don't know how many people play mobile games within a platform. I know it does happen more in WeChat in mainland China because WeChat has for years been a super app that you do lots of things in. And people kind of forget that WeChat is even an app. They, they think of it as a as a big platform where you do lots of things it's it's almost akin to an operating system and i don't think in europe and in and north america we have an equivalent for that and here people tend to just want an app uh it's way too early to tell if people are picking up the netflix games because you know they're kind of weird and unfocused and there hasn't been one that everybody's talking about but i don't think they have yet so jury the jury's still out <laughs> uh, uh well i mean Gaming's tricky, right? It's a very fickle market, but I do think that we would probably be having a lot of these same conversations about Facebook. But do people want to play a game oh, on gosh, Facebook? Yeah. And and as it turns out, yes. Uh, uh, Plants vs. Zombies and Farmville have become absolute gigantic juggernauts, largely because they had a captive audience of people who wanted to kill time while also on a website where you kill time. So when it comes But are they still? I think, was that or was that a phase? With Facebook. I think that's an interesting test case. Well, I think we would probably have to look at the numbers because... Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, uh, I, I, I don't I, hear people talking about going to Facebook to play games as much now as they used to. I guess that's all I'm thinking. Sure. Although I, I don't know if we... I think we are probably in a more transient demo than some of the folks who are probably still plugging away on Farmville. Uh, that being said, it depends on the game, obviously. If the games are good, then they will get more traction. I think it is more likely that this fits... TikTok's demo, yeah, and it does Netflix's, but that is purely a guess, and that is not knowing exactly what these products are going to be. And TikTok's positive are: I love to discover funny, weird, new things on TikTok, and if TikTok can nail, and it sounds like with Duyen, they've been getting some experience, they could nail that seamless. I go from you know one funny uh, meme video into a game that's fun they might be able to to make a go of this. If anybody can, they maybe it's them. 
On the other hand, it has to be fast. Nobody likes to spend a lot of time on TikTok. It's, Wait, it, you, hey, you, well, no. no one likes to spend a lot of time on any one thing on TikTok. They spend yeah. hours on TikTok, but it has yeah, to be yeah. in you know quick twelve second chunks, right? Here, here's the thing that I would say: TikTok is very uh, uh, issue dependent. Like there is like there's a reason why you always that the, there is the, the suffix talk to everything. I'm on politics talk. I'm on communist talk. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. On cooking talk, right? If sugar talk. If there is a a a meme worthy game or a game for which TikTok users want to share their experiences and strategies, then they will have a natural advantage. Well, folks, uh, what do you want us to talk about on the show? Uh, you you can email us feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. You can hit me up on Cheyong Talk, or you can go to our subreddit, submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. <laughs> A group of U.S. senators introduced legislation Thursday called the Competition and Transparency in Digital Advertising Act. The sponsors of the bill are Senators Mike Lee of Utah, Ted Cruz of Texas, Amy Klobuchar of Minnesota, and Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut. Justin, I don't, I don't know why, but that seems like an odd grouping of names. Who are these folks? Well, uh... uh... Look, for those of you who don't follow U.S. politics that close, these senators are not from the same party. And you most specifically do not see folks like Ted Cruz, Ted Cruz and Amy Klobuchar cooperating a bit. So it may not be a lock for passage, but it won't be a straight partisan line that would keep it from passing if it does fail. What did these folks cooperate on then? Well, the bill put some price transparency requirements and consumer responsibility rules for the business processing more than $5 billion a year in digital ads. But the main thrust is that one company cannot process more than $20 billion a year in a more than one section of the digital advertising industry. Tom, you did the briny and actually read the bill. What does this mean specifically? Uh, it's, it was a much shorter bill than the ones that Jen Bridey from Congressional Dish reads. But yes, I did. Uh, and here's what it says. Number one, you can't own an advertising exchange. That's like an auction house. You know how ad word, yeah. AdWords. Uh, you can't own an advertising exchange if you also own a brokerage for selling or buying ads or if you sell ad space. Sound like anyone you know? Uh, number two, you can't own a brokerage for selling ads if you also own one for buying ads, you can't buy and sell. You can't play both ends of the market if this bill goes through. Number three, you can't own either buying or selling brokerages if you also buy or sell ad space. And if you didn't catch on already, Google does all of these things. Yes. All of these cases apply to Google. If the bill becomes law, affected companies would have a year from when it goes into effect to a comply. And in Google's case, it might then be forced to sell off parts of its advertising business, something it's had since the early 21st century when it bought DoubleClick. Uh, Meta might also need to divest parts of its advertising business as well. Uh, I didn't hear Amazon mentioned, probably because they don't hit the 20 billion mark in all of those sections. You have to hit the 20 billion mark across the sections. Uh, Justin, what do you think the chances are of this becoming law, though? Well, one hurdle is the House, and a similar bill is expected to be introduced in the House later this week by Representative Ken Buck of Colorado and Representative Pramila Jayapal of Washington. They are not in the same party, so you have two bills that could reconcile should they both pass. On the other hand, it's a pretty big deal to enact this law. The Senate bill is technically an amendment to the Clayton Act of 1914, an antitrust law that has not been amended since the 1970s. But hey, everything in the 70s is coming back, so why not amend the Clayton Act while we're here? Sure. Would it get out of committee? Uh, your mileage may vary. Vary. Though Senator Klobuchar is the chair of the subcommittee handling the bill and has moved forward the American Innovation and Choice Online Act, which would prevent platforms from favoring their own products over those of the competitors that rely on their services, and the Open App Markets Act, which is similar but about app stores, those are out of committee but have not gone to a vote. Yeah, uh, and it's probably obvious, but worth noting that Google opposes this bill. <laughs> they they've, they are on record. Uh Meta hasn't commented, or at least I haven't seen a comment from Meta yet, but I, I don't know. I would guess they might not uh, be in favor of the bill either, uh, unless they thought it would hurt Google more than them, maybe. Uh, no, I, no, I, no, 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 no. Nobody wants to see that. This is, and let me let me make this clear. 
these companies exist on this technology. It's Google they, particularly and Facebook. Facebook and Google, Google and particularly. Facebook specifically. They, they are ad sales companies. Everything else they do is either superfluous to or serving of the goose that lays the golden eggs. And that is advertising, advertising, advertising. This isn't a problem. This isn't a hurdle. This is an existential crisis for both of these companies. Yeah, uh, I, I think this would make more headlines or will make more headlines should it get to a floor vote. Uh, should it get to a point where it's it's possible to become law? Uh, help me navigate this. Am I right in thinking that uh, it's it's hard enough to get things out of committee, although they've got bipartisan support, so that helps. Uh, it's then getting getting enough overt sentiment to bring it to a vote. It it's kind of easy for for representatives, particularly, but but also senators, to just not participate in bringing it to a vote and therefore it just gets, you know, shoved behind other priorities. Yeah. It really needs to gain the favor of the leadership too. So Chuck Schumer, who right now is the Senate majority leader would have to say, this is an important thing that we believe is going to be for the best of the country and the democratic party. Mm -hmm. the, the big issue that, you know, in terms of the timing is that we are, about to walk into the dog days of summer in a in a, in a, in an election year and those are not exactly fertile grounds for any kind of law to pass at all no matter what because everybody's heading into elections and they don't want to upset any kind of alchemy that they that 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 they can so uh what i would expect is that there's a lot of ads being purchased by every lobbyist shop on k street uh, uh targeted both to uh, uh, Google and Facebook headquarters, because uh, I think that this, this is a full court press to kill these bills immediately. Yeah, because, uh, first of all, there could be donation pressure. Uh, it, could, it could be very, you know, covert, not overt. Uh, you know, if you want us to back your reelection in the midterms, uh, you know, we don't want you working against us. But also being bipartisan isn't a benefit here, right? Because... It's not like this gets voted on and one party gets to crow that they were the ones who took down big tech. Also, we just had that we just had that uh, report a couple of days ago that Pew Research Center found that the number of people who think tech companies sh should face more regulation is falling. Now, it's it's 44 percent. It's still a lot of people. If you just walk out on the street, you'll find plenty of people who think they need to be more regulated. But it's going out of fashion, not increasing in fashion. And that's across party lines. Because by and large, people like free products, <laughs> and 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 a lot of this is free product, right? Google is a service for which people use so much that we don't even think about using it. Facebook has become an indelible part of people's lives so much so that when I'm out on the road and I'm covering candidates, it is among the first thing that's brought up uh, uh, is uh, what are we going to do about Facebook? Their Facebook is censoring us, but that means that people care about that more than a lot of other bedrock issues that I have seen that have dominated politics for 50 years. It matters a lot. People are happy with it. They, sometimes they don't like what happens when they're on it. But by and large, I think people like the fact that these services exist. Yeah. And I think like all things with the public, you know, they only stay mad at the same thing for a while before you move on and get mad at something else. And yeah. big tech, may they may get be getting tired of it like that well, nothing changed let's i don't know what the next thing is but you know it i'm and i'm not saying everybody's letting big tech off the hook or that they should even i'm just saying it does seem like there's a little fatigue setting in on that issue well i think also uh, uh, one last thing on this there is uh, this is a bit of an esoteric thing uh, i don't think that the average voter the average citizen knows exactly what separating these parts of the ad business for Google would really do. Sure. Now, people in the know understand this is them trying to stab both of these companies in the heart, and it is it is very punitive. That being said, I don't know if that translates to retail. Yeah. And, and, uh, if It's more of a privacy or a censorship uh, play if you're going for popularity. Uh, actually getting bipartisan support to break up uh, digital ads because you think it's it's bad for the economy and, and bad for competition. 
That doesn't, you're right. That, that just doesn't have a slogan attached to it. As well. Yeah. All right. I got a slogan for this though. Samsung has a line of bespoke refrigerators that are modular and customizable. If you didn't know this, uh, you can decide how many, we're not just talking about the, 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 uh, shelves inside, how many drawers, how many, how many doors, where the freezer is, stuff like that. One of the customizations on Samsung's bespoke line lets you choose from a selection of colors and prints for the door. Now you may be saying to yourself, well, that isn't really bespoke if it's a limited selection. <laughs> Guess what? Samsung hears you. It's adding a new option. If you give Samsung 500 bucks, you can have any photo or image you like within reason printed on the unit's double doors. This option is launching for buyers sometime later this year. And if you're already an owner of a bespoke fridge from Samsung, you can order the door panels separately and swap them in. That runs you 250 bucks a panel. Samsung says it'll take about eight weeks from your order to print and ship your new panels. They're also going to screen for copyright violations and explicit images. So if you're going to put Pulp Fiction on there, maybe you're not going to get that. Uh, or perhaps an intimate photo of yourself wouldn't make it through. Uh, but, you know, picture of the family out there or some artwork. You know, you want to put your kids' uh, artwork on the fridge? You could make your kids' artwork the fridge. I And make it permanent. You know, yeah. you only ever do one piece of art, and I'm sure that will always, ha uh, you know, stand the test of time. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of people regretting they did this, is my guess. Well, I mean, here's my thing. It just takes a long time. I, I don't know how yeah. many people have bought a refrigerator uh, uh, after the chip shortage and, and, and the supply chain issues, but it, it was a two-month wait for me and and to add another two months to it so I could put whatever uh, dumb ding dong thing uh, I wanted on my doors. I don't know. That's that's a quarter. Like I am I am I am uh, uh, waiting a very long time for a refrigerator. Yeah. Or maybe you're waiting a long time for a refrigerator anyway. Why not get a bespoke one with a, a lovely picture of your garden on it? I mean, like five hundred bucks. And that's that's a significant cost. This is a two thousand dollar fridge to begin with, yeah. and then you're adding five hundred bucks on top of that. Yeah, I mean, uh, good good for Samsung on finding a new way that they can upcharge. But holy moly, let us know what picture you'd put on your fridge that would permanently be on your fridge until you were willing to pay five hundred dollars to replace it. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Uh, let's check out that mailbag. Dwayne from Germany wrote in and said, "I know these coins." Bitcoins, crypto coins can be unconventional, but they work amazingly well for me and many others. I'm in the process of buying a home in Barbados and Tether and USD, both stable coins, made it possible to send funds to my lawyer, cousin and contractor in a timely manner while paying way less fees. Normally, it would cost me $40 to wire money to the island, which then would take 10 to 14 days to be received. Using Binance US, I can send them funds in minutes and pay an 80 cent withdrawal fee. Unconventional, but convenient. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it look, uh, uh, there is a million uh, hours of conversation that can be had about crypto coin, but uh, uh, I think that the point of it in general is so there can be fairly frictionless transfer of of money that's and that's there's part of the part of the, the the cool part about it there's crypto coin and there's crypto coin right uh the, the there's bitcoin and ethereum which can have high gas fees and, and actually cost yeah. you a lot it can be slow uh not every crypto coin is the same and i think what Dwayne is pointing out here is the the stable coins are built specifically to make this kind of process work well yeah. and Dwayne's saying works great for me Definitely, definitely is an advantage. So that's why I, I had said yesterday, and I'll say it again, it, you should resist the temptation to paint all, all the efforts with the same brush. Some are Terra, and you probably should have known that wasn't a great idea. Some are Tether, which I would like more transparency, but maybe it is a good idea. And, and, and Dwayne explains a use case of what, what it's good for. Yeah. Well, I know what Justin Robert Young is good for. He's good for being here on DTNS, sharing his insights with us, uh, as well as lots of other great shows that you got going on. What 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 are some of those? Uh, well, I'll tell you what. We we mentioned uh, the uh, 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 Jen Briney of Congressional Dish, and uh, this week we are launching a new podcast with myself, Jen Briney, and Andrew Heaton of the Political Orphanage. It's called We're Not Wrong. If you like uh, shows about uh, a political conversation, then then I, I think this one is going to be for you. I would say it's 
somewhere in the the reason roundtable blocked and reported fifth column kind of genre. Uh, so uh, so go ahead and 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 check it out. Uh, uh, I've had a really really good time doing it so far. And then as far as PX3 goes, I'm going to be in Georgia this weekend covering those primaries. Yeah. Some people get their peaches down in Georgia. Justin gets his primaries. Down I do. I do. And they're just as juicy, Tom. <laughs> uh, folks, uh, I want to thank our longtime supporters. Uh, we are always looking for new patrons, and we make a big deal about the new patrons when we get them. Could be you tomorrow. But today, we're going to thank Ben Vaughn, who has been with us for a long time and is one of our top lifetime supporters. Thank you, Ben, uh, for all the years of support. Uh, ben is one of those folks who's going to get the longer version of the show called Good Day Internet at patreon.com slash DTNS. We're also live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more about that at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow, Len Peralta will be here illustrating. Patrick Norton will be here talking about how to track down a Raspberry Pi for your next project. You'll be here too, right? Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>